Then we get the absolutely unexpected, jaw-dropping news that Altax was really Yonder Assimilator and Wadagaki was only finishing the level. The unexpected twist that left me scratching my head, that Sakura Wadagaki was the one who killed Yuki Mitsuya. What's good with y'all, man? We got All Taxi, a 13 episode mystery thriller with a straight faced walrus at its center. Mr. Hiroshi Atakawa was so fun to watch on screen. This bitch took me a minute to make, I'm not gonna hold you. So please consider beating the goofy out that like button like that bitch owes you money, my nigga. I ain't gonna hold y'all niggas up too long, and also consider subscribing if you fuck with the content on the channel. Anyway, let's get into it. Based on the loan we see Kakahane take out in episode 5, and the info on the x-ray of Arakawa's brain in episode 7, we can assume that the events that happened in our taxi were in 2021. On May 25th of 1980, Hiroshi Arakawa from Chichibu City in Saitama Prefecture was born to an office worker, Kiyoshi Arakawa, and his wife, Yumi Arakawa. The story picks up when the 10-year-old Arakawa was in the fourth grade suffering from the perils of pubescent torment. Arakawa was severely bullied in school, and through a lack of self-worth, esteem, and identity is convinced that he is a walrus and the damning conclusion that humans are nothing more than animals. He had no escape from the abuse because it often followed him home. He got a break from crying at home because his tears seemed to dry up when his mother started to flow. We know kids are mean, but the authority figures in his life were evil. To his teachers, he was a dunce, and to his mother, he was a punching bag. With most of Arakawa's days filled with frustration and embarrassment, he escapes reality with visits to the zoo and long car rides with his absentee father who spends most of his time with his mistress. Arakawa likes his deadbeat dad okay because his gift, the animal encyclopedia, was the only light in this boy's dark life. He expected so little from the humans around him that an animal encyclopedia was all that was needed to win him over. Nothing bugs me more than seeing abused kids being satisfied with mediocrity, but I can't blame them because it's much easier to fill the bellies of those accustomed to starving which makes everything that Arakawa cherished even sadder because they were all heavily influenced by the neglectful nature of his absentee father. The boy probably received the animal encyclopedia because it was a buck fifty at a thrift store and his dad felt bad for forgetting his birthday. The boy was never taken on car rides or to the zoo to enjoy himself, but left there because it was convenient. After a couple of, um, might I say uncomfortable stares into animals' eyes, he then returns to reality. Bullying, neglect, and abuse was his daily vitamin. Though life was somber for Arakawa, his dreams of either being a zookeeper or a taxi driver kept him going. Arakawa's mom had issues, and she just could not stop eating. So she burned calories cooking a mean three-piece combo, with Arakawa being the main dish. Arakawa's mom proves she's a threat to society, and drives into the sea with her son and plastered husband. Arakawa's parents meet their fate, and Arakawa miraculously escapes. Arakawa is left scarred for life, but oblivious to the tragedies of his past developing dissociative amnesia. Arakawa wakes up in a hospital bed feeling noticeably odd and dizzy. His doctor, an alligator, and he, a walrus. Arakawa develops visual agnosia caused by executive dysfunction, where lapses in cognitive function due to brain damage destroy what his eyes perceive. In other words, he now sees people as animals. Not only that, there were pandas and beavers and tortoises and llamas and stuff too. Life got a little easier for Arakawa, a lot less anxiety and awkward eye contact. He spent two months at Minami Nakano Hospital, under the care of Dr. Kato. There, Arakawa was told to keep a memory notebook to track his mental recovery, where he tracked his daily activities and routines, from lunch and bath time to when to take his medication. The doctors read his diary and ruled him out to be a strange guy, whereas most of the medical staff openly pitied the boy, but he was, but a pa 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 I'm loving it, making shadow monsters and shit. A mysterious benefactor swoops in and takes Arakawa to Tokyo. The Tapir was a hero to the boy, for this meant a new life in a vivid city, one away from the meetings at school. He again uttered his elation at being a walrus and vowed to someday thank the Tapir for his extreme act of kindness. After some unspecified amount of time, he was given a house with all expenses paid, and though being ten at the time, primarily took care of himself. A couple of years later, Arakawa insists on paying rent even though it was free, his guardian decided to save these payments. Though we don't get a lot of info on Arakawa's journey from adolescence to adulthood, we can just assume that he lands a job as a taxi driver. Arakawa and Dr. Gariki meet three years before the happenings of the series, with Dr. Gariki trying to concentrate on his book and Arakawa listening to the Homo Sapiens radio show. Dr. Gariki tells him to turn it off because it was annoying 
and Adokawa proceeds to end the gorilla's whole career for the rudeness. Through their semi-heated conversation, we learn that Gariki is 38, the same age as Adokawa, and that Adokawa got jokes. He plays the role of a self-proclaimed psychic, correctly guessing Gariki's profession, calling Gariki a geezer, and also finding a shortcut to the doc's clinic. Though Adokawa reveals he just has a good memory and has driven Gariki before, this created a lasting impression that spurred a friendship. Three years later, in October of 2021, marks the beginning of the events of episode 1 through 13. With a now 41 year old Adokawa, life becomes an anime. The story starts with a little bit of a red hearing, with depictions of a body being disposed of at sea and Adokawa waking from a night terror, looking quite guilty. Then we get breaking news a high school girl has gone missing in the area. The first thread of the web of mystery has been woven. Adokawa nonchalantly bodies his juice and discards it in his glove box. Inside, we see that he is on some form of oral medication. The station is flipped to the Homo sapiens, where they share the exciting news that they have passed round one of the N1 for aspiring comedians, and that they are supposedly not funny due to the opinions of a high school boy. Then Mystery Kiss's debut single, Supernatural Love Phenomenon, is played. Adokawa then meets the boy who believes that the void within himself can only be filled with the adulations of going viral. This boy's name is Kabasawa. A few moments later, Adokawa is convinced to aid in achieving the boy's goals, well, kind of. The iconic selfie is taken, a straight-faced walrus, an elated hippo, and a demonic monkey chilling in the cut. Kabasawa posts a selfie with a caption at a straight cap. Deceit is something not too foreign to the boy. Then the two cops show up, one nefarious and one oblivious. They pull Arakawa over and question him about the whereabouts of the mysterious monkey and their recent selfie. Arakawa retorts with his own line of questioning, stating that the older brother and the monkey are friends. The younger brother questions the validity of this information. The other one wheels his way out of this one. The duo are set free, and Kabasawa asks Arakawa why he became a taxi driver. The walrus has a flashback of his dark childhood. Kabasawa leaves his phone. Arakawa realizes that not only did he go viral, but the guy in question was in the background with his viral selfie. The next day, Arakawa speaks to the skeletons in his closet, perhaps. Within the web of mystery, multiple threads have been woven. At Arakawa's doctor appointment, he is introduced to the infamous original master Don Raku Eraser and violates Gariki once again. <laughs> Soon after, we learn that Arakawa is the prime suspect in the Narima missing high school girl case. Go figure. Big Dama then takes the dash cam footage from Arakawa's taxi. Kakahana struggles in the dating market, and Arakawa's friends hear that he is the prime suspect in the missing girl case. We learn that Dobu is not to be messed with, and medicine has been stolen from Dr. Gariki's clinic. Then the alpaca is added to the equation when she catches Arakawa's taxi. I gotta say, Shirakawa gave me serial killer vibes. This had to have been done purposely. The atmosphere and mood was so dark. In one scene, the plot began to thicken with stolen meds and the missing girl. In the next, we see a cute alpaca <laughs> giggle within the stillness of the car engine. Shortly after, we see Dobu pull up with his devilish swagger and make a trade with Big Domin, an envelope for dash cam data, confirming that Big Domin is indeed in the underworld's back pocket. Adokawa and Shurikawa's drive continues, but awkwardly. Though Adokawa tries to play the homo sapiens to mask the awkwardness, the awkwardness was much louder. Too loud to hear the struggling comedians on the radio, Shurikawa breaks the silence by talking about Adokawa's sleep patterns. Then she asks if he likes anyone. Arakawa retorts saying he is too old for that. Then he asks her if she likes anyone. The alpaca shoots her shot. And let's just say she was either possessed by Steph Curry in Game 3 or Clay Thompson against the Bulls in 2018. She puts her phone in selfie mode and gives it to Arakawa. The question was, who does she like? The answer is, you my guy. Arakawa and Kakahana later go to the sauna. And Arakawa tells Kakahana everything that went on between him and Shirakawa the night prior. Kakana is shocked, even a little sad because of his own situation, but he offers Arakawa advice. Arakawa rejects the simp's advice, smart move. Then the $10 million picture is taken, and the free fall past rock bottom commences for Kakahana. Kabasawa, determined to go viral again, sets his eyes on Arakawa, and we are introduced to Mystery Kiss as they struggle for relevance. Arakawa meets Imai, the Mystery Kiss superfan, and gives him the numbers from the $10 million picture from before. 2, 10, 12, 18, 20, 32, 33. I think these numbers have a deeper meaning, and I've been trying to decipher this for way too long. Arakawa gets a booty call from the alpaca, 
Then the Homo sapiens hop in a taxi, and the warthog Shibagaki starts to flame Baba for holding the group back. Then the bombshells drop that the world thinks much the opposite. Dobu pulls up and the hype was warranted. He is definitely about that action. Dobu threatens to kill Adokawa if he does not play as a pawn in his game of chess against Yano. Adokawa refuses and Dobu forces his hand, threatening Shirakawa. Dobu makes his leave. Adokawa speeds off remembering his plans with Shirakawa and creates Tokyo's next supervillain. Adokawa miraculously makes it on time to see her and they chat until sunrise. Adokawa tells her it's dangerous to be involved with them and she tells him she knows Koporia. Baba gets his big break and Kakahana continues on his free fall past rock bottom. Adokawa's comments strike a chord within a desperate bachelor. He questions the mystery girl's motives and tries to take a look at Kakahana's dating profile. A scuffle ensues over the phone. Then we learn the lengths of Kakahana's desperation. A once high school graduate making less than 30k a year to a 41 year old graduate making 200k a year. Yeah, that brother's starving. Yes, sir, brother. <laughs> but it's hard not to feel bad for my boy. Keep your head up, Kakahana. Soon after, Kakahana meets his mystery girl and she is indeed real. Real. Devious. The guy that Arakawa did wrong is fixing to get right. Tanaka gets his hands on Dobu's hidden gun. He plans to get it back in blood. In exchange for 16 years of his life, he wants the rest of Arakawa's. <laughs> Arakawa's chauffeur is Yamamoto. Mitsuya and Ichimura are both picked up and dropped off to practice. Then Arakawa's taxi is followed by a guy who has been living for this moment, and a guy who was on go. After a bit of mental gymnastics, both parties try to avoid showing their hands. Yamamoto asks for the dash cam footage. Bingo. And Arakawa grows skeptical. Within a web of mystery, multiple threads have been tangled. Tanaka, the bug eyed bandit, finds Arakawa's home. Goriki closes the clinic because of the stolen meds. Arakawa pins on Shirakawa because of her debt and affiliation with the neighborhood menace, Dobu. Arakawa and Dobu meet. Dobu ultimately loses leverage because Shirakawa is already in his clutches, but this is quickly regained when Dobu threatens to drown Arakawa. Arakawa yields due to his innate fear of water and tells Dobu the other person who wants the dash cam footage, Yamamoto, manager of Mystery Kiss. Then we cut to Kakahana's free fall past rock bottom. He proceeds to get played like a fiddle and used like a chair. I wish to stop there, but then he attempts to ask for her hand in marriage. <sighs> After possibly the second date. Yeah, that brother's starving. Yes, sir, brother. <laughs> oh yeah, Arakawa's $10 million photo was indeed a $10 million photo. And Kawasawa becomes a vigilante in the name of Goron Varo, vowing that he will capture Dobo by the end of the year. You can't make this stuff up. But since it's an anime, I guess you can. He even goes to the lengths of saying that he will make the infamous Dobu apologize for his crimes. <laughs> Let's save this clip for later. <laughs> Kakahana takes out a loan to pay for a date that is over $1,000. Kakahana manages somehow 2x gravity to aid his free fall past rock bottom. 19.62 meters per second squared is quick. The next day, Arakawa gets news that Imai has won the lottery with his numbers and he advises the boy to be more discreet. Imai offers Arakawa a portion, but he refuses. So Imai cashes him out and they go to the cabaret club where Arakawa is given free service for life. This great scene is short lived for it is interrupted with Kakahana going wedding ring shopping. This guy is down terrible. I would like to play the clip, but I think we get the idea. The bug eye bandit pulls up and starts airing shit out. Tanaka shows Shibigaki that this indeed is not a toy gun and that he should have evacuated the premises like Arakawa who made his escape through the back door. Arakawa realizes that his car has been broken into and Shirakawa is quite persistent. Shirakawa is waiting at his front door because of Arakawa's silent treatment. They go over to a bench to chat. Shirakawa tells Arakawa everything, even the fact that Dobu and her were in a romantic relationship. She also tells him that Dobu's goal is to rob a bank and he wants Arakawa to be his getaway driver. Arakawa, feeling betrayed, takes his leave. The alpaca confesses her love to Walrus and the walrus keeps a player. Shibigaki's recent traumatic experience becomes a talking point on the homo sapien radio show as they debate on what is the best form of comedy. Kakahana continues to disappoint me. Baba gets swarmed by girls. Shibigaki by a crackhead. The world isn't fair. Kabasawa, consumed by his vigilante persona, reports on the shooting at the white dolphin. Dobu looks at the evidence and tells Arakawa that the bug-eyed bandit is indeed trying to serve him a one-way ticket to the gulag. 
So they decided to join forces, united under a common enemy, Arakawa, for protection, the reopening of the clinic, and the freedom of Shirakawa, Dobu, to gather intel and get back what is rightfully his. With the risk being worth the reward, they shake on it. Arakawa is officially in too deep. We find out that Baba is dating Nakaido, the lead singer of Mystery Kiss, tying the homo sapiens to the already messy web of mystery. Someone shoots at Arakawa's home while he was away looking for Kapasawa. Kakahana is getting ready to propose with a ring that has a sizable rock. The size of the rock gives me anxiety. Considering Kakehana's financial situation, debt collectors come beating at his door. Little Dom is trusting his big brother waivers, and Arakawa takes the opportunity to devise a plan to capture Dobu and Big Diamond. Arakawa wins Lord Diamond over by flattery and displaying a strong sense of justice. A body is found at Shibara Wharf and Minato Ward, and Shirakawa goes about making amends for his irresponsible actions. Gariki realizes that their win of good fortune must be Arakawa's doing, so they decide to diagnose and treat him. Here I run to my first issue with the timeline of Hiroshi Arakawa's life. Based on the date of the loan that Kakana took out for the date, it is currently the year 2021, but these medical records show that Arakawa was born in year 555. Arakawa either has to be 146 years old, or there has to be an error somewhere. Was this an intentional error? You know what? When did Mitsuya start working with Tanaka? Judging from her leaving the tracking device that led Tanaka to Arakawa's house, Kakahana gets kidnapped, a love star of man, punished for having sustenance delivered by the fork of the seat. Arakawa scans the young crowd using his power of discernment in hopes of locating Kabasawa. Arakawa bumps into Yano and he puts on a show. He didn't make the role in Devil Man Crybaby, but he got his big break in our taxi. Ichimura wants to stop running Badger games. Arakawa and Dobu plan on how to capture Kabasawa, and Little Diamond starts to see the evil within his big brother. Dobu beats the goofy out of an impersonator, thinking he is the real deal, and Kabasawa gets it all on cam. You gotta hand it to Kabasawa. He is determined and he has W timing. The scene was so set up for Kabasawa to win that it almost felt staged. What else does a vigilante need than to get viral footage of his arch nemesis in the act? I laughed so hard at the scene. <laughs> Kabasawa is so goofy. Buddy did the Naruto run after capturing pure digital gold. Then we get the coldest entrance for the show's most unforgettable character with an instrumental that is more gassed than the Ethereum blockchain. I saw the polar bear and thought to myself, that tracksuit is kinda hard. Just for Yano to agree, that was the moment that I knew that I would love Yano's character and what he brings to the show. Yamamoto calls Arakawa the chauffeur. Dobu tells Arakawa to sell the dash cam footage to him for at least 1 billion yen. What a coincidence. Dobu then hides in a trunk. While Yamamoto haggles over the price for the dashcam footage, Arakawa has leverage here. 1 billion yen, take it or leave it. The gullible and desperate Kakahana hits bedrock. <laughs> Gariki tests his theory of Arakawa's diagnosis by sending him a cryptic picture, and Arakawa effortlessly discerns that it is Kakahana then calls Gariki an unemployed bum. Gariki tells Shirakawa how he and Arakawa met as evidence for Arakawa having synthesia. Gariki meets up with Arakawa at Yamabiko to have drinks. Shirakawa rejects the request because of the tension with Arakawa. Gariki has fun testing his synthesia theory on the subject. Yamamoto was scared that he'll be arrested any moment. The polar bear says it smells like bitching here. Yamamoto remembers that he can manipulate in mind the mystery Kisper fan who won the 1 billion yen lottery. Sekiguchi remembers that they can just rob him. Yano chimes in and calls Kakahana's mom for him. This nigga's a villain. Kabasawa's antics are bolstered from the clout of catching Dobu and 4K. Teiko, the bartender from Yamabiko, notices that Kakahana is missing and the homo sapiens make it to the semifinals. Arakawa and Dobu discuss the state of things in this messy tangle of events. Then Dobu drops that he wants to rob a bank. Well, more specifically, the lottery winner. Knowing that Amai is Yano's only option to get the dashcam footage, Dobu has already laid out the groundwork for his master plan. Arakawa is quite cunning and records the whole thing, but Dobu isn't a slouch either and catches on to the incriminating line of questioning. Arakawa tells Imai to delete his lottery post, say it was a lie, get out of town, and lay low, considering he is being pursued by multiple people who comfortably commit heinous crimes. Amai takes his advice. Arakawa realizes who Kakahana is in bed with, or tried to get in bed with. The walrus is off to save his friend, but he sends a cheeky email to our neighborhood superhero to be there or be square. 
We see the powers of fame and status at work, but Kabasawa senses the undertones of disrespect from the girl. He says, To the dungeon! And she says, Nah, you. Kabasawa is jolted out of his sunken place by Arakawa's call to action. Arakawa breaks down the situation to Dobu on his drive to the wharf. The bug guy bandit pulls up and starts dumping. With a little bit of maneuvering, the duo miraculously get out of this one unscathed and continue their quest to save Kakahana. Arakawa and Dobu pull up to the scene and they get active. The gorilla and polar bear start jacking. Oos, oos, ha, ha. Oos, oos, ha, ha. Arakawa finds Kakahana tattered, disheveled, and debased, but alive. They make their escape. This track suit wearing goon gets his eight hours, and Dobu's almost sent to the graveyard. Arakawa delivers a long winded story to tell Kakahana that he is pathetic. Kakahana agrees, and they laugh it off. Kabasawa's moment of glory is cut short when he forgets that Dobu is indeed built differently. Dobu chokes him and gives him the trusty rock bottom. Kabasawa surrenders immediately, displaying energy that is a complete 180 from what was displayed before. Dobu schools Kabasawa and actually gives him great advice. Dobu has always been great at reading people and finding insecurities, leading him to say brilliant things like this. Dobu tells the boy to find a trustworthy mentor that he respects. Kabasawa was very open to the advice and used it as a catalyst to turn his life around. He may be able to find a job and get his work done. More importantly, he can develop a sense of identity and self respect. But Dobu says this advice ain't free. He accepts compensation monetarily, automotively, residentially, and shamefully. The once big headed Kabasawa does the unthinkable. From self proclaimed god to squandering fool, an individual reduced to the status of a favela dwelling rat. Now for the clip that I have saved in my inventory. It was taking up space, but it sure did come in handy. Napoleon, give me some of your tots. No, go find your own. Come on, give me some of your tots. No, I'm freaking starved. I didn't get to eat anything today. Ugh. Gross. Freaking idiot. After public humiliation is complete, Dobu throws the boy's phone to see which was extremely funny. He did it so quickly. The viral internet infection has been inoculated. Kakahana also throws away a couple months rent into a river. The phone and the ring. Two things that have symbolized the ruin of man. The need for approval and the desperation for love. Swallowed by the silent aggression of water. Goriki meets Arakawa's guardian and learns of Arakawa's past and living situation. Then the bomb is dropped. That Arakawa's parents weren't missing but dead. This fact hits Goriki like the splashback when dropping a deuce and the homo sapiens gets sent to the losing bracket. Despite Amai's attempt to fake a losing lottery ticket, Yano isn't fooled and sets his sights solely on the mystery kid superfan. Yamamoto grows desperate and tries to coerce Arakawa to hand over the dashcam footage. Arakawa offers to help Yamamoto if he betrays his boss. The lack of sleep, guilt, and constant stress gets to Yamamoto, so he kills two birds with one stone. He takes out the guy holding his livelihood at a ransom for 1 billion yen, and he blows out some steam. Shirakawa saves the day with some cold corporea, Literally hit Buddy with the Leaf Whirlwind. Truly the Leaf Village's handsomest devil. Leaving Dude quite relaxed. Yamamoto surprisingly has a change of heart and decides to cooperate. Arakawa realizes that Dobu isn't really a bad guy. He lives by a strict set of laws and values. Bickering with Shirakawa over the broken window jokes to Walrus's memory. Arakawa deduces that Tanaka, the bug eyed bandit, must have a tracking device in his car. Kakahana begins getting his life back together. Now being December, Arakawa meets the mysterious appearing Dasana who demonstrates his love for death now stating that there's a 5% chance that Arakawa kidnapped the missing girl from Nerima High School. Yano finds Amai, well more correctly Saguchi does, demonstrating that he is good at tracking people down. A little too good at tracking people down. Yano agrees and also demonstrates he is just as weird. Dobu tells Arakawa the details of the 1 billion yen heist, where Yano's camp gets one real case of cash and 9 fake ones. Then Dobu swoops in and takes the 9 remaining real ones. After the 9 are secured by Dobu, Big Diamond will stop Yano, and within the confusion, Dobu will swoop by and finesse the last real case of cash. The heist name, Odd what Taxi. Taxi. It's Sersky. <laughs> That's good. Arakawa later calls Yamamoto and tells them exactly how to sabotage the Odd Taxi. Simply check more than one Duraluminum case for counterfeit cash. 
and Yamamoto agrees in the name of Mystery Kiss. Arakawa stops by Amada's apartment and briefs him on his foreboding kidnapping by Yano's camp. Kariki ends up at Arakawa's elementary school in his search for what is wrong with his friend. The body found in Shibari Wolf has been identified as both the missing girl from Naruma High School and Yuki Mitsuya, member of auto group Mystery Kiss. Multiple threads in the web of mystery have been woven. We get a look into the mystery origins of Mystery Kiss, full of jealousy, passion, and deceit. We get the idol's motives for chasing fame. Ichimura, to be rich. Yuki, to make memories. And Nakaido, unhappy with Yuki's wholesome response. With Yuki taking a spot as new center and quickly meeting her demise after, Nakaido naturally would be a prime suspect. Passionate and aspiring young idol loses her spot as lead singer. Even a cyclops with one eye closed could see the motive. Nakato telling Yuki to meet her alone didn't help her case either. Nakato also had clear intent to kill with her automaton being for Yuki. Step down the center or I'll kill you. If L was on this one, there's an 85% chance that Nakato murdered Yuki. Yamamoto walks in, wishing he could walk out, but he questions the girl anyway. Nakato denies killing her. He believes and caused Yano to dismember and dispose of the body in Shibara Wharf. This comes at a huge cost for Mystery Kiss, half of Mystery Kiss's future profits, and free labor from the idols. They replace Yuki with Sakura Watagaki, and she goes by Yuki Mitsuyu to keep things as covert as possible. The idols accept Nakaido, wear masks to conceal their identity. Back to the current timeline. December 25th comes bearing many gifts to misfortune. Dobu has been naughty the whole year, but is confident that his present will be right there waiting for him. Yano has caused him a lot of trouble, but with the odd taxi, he's about to get even. Mystery Kiss is set to have a press conference on Christmas Day to deal with the backlash for Yuki Mitsuya, the idol who was seemingly alive, being dead for two months, thus removing Yamamoto from the equation, which is great for Dobu, but horrible for Arakawa. Arakawa tries to find a plan B. Imai is captured but is too saddened by the news of Yuki's death to care. Yamamoto and Nakaido feel the way of the world crashing down around them, while Baba and Shibagaki compete in the N1 losing bracket. Shibagaki urges Baba to take the competition more seriously, and Baba's face speaks for itself. Bitch, please. Gariki finds the details of Arakawa's parents' death. A double suicide, drowned at the bottom of the sea. Mystery Kiss holds a press conference, and Yamamoto does a good job of feigning complete innocence. He has blood on his hands that he can never wash away. Gariki meets with Arakawa's old doctor to get more information on Arakawa's mental state after the tragedy, and demands access to Arakawa's childhood diary. The heist begins. The van is loaded with cash, and Yano wants to check more than one case. The polar bear fumbles the bag and saves at the same time. Benefiting Dobu, but bad for Yano and Arakawa. Yano's cat makes out with one real and nine fake cases of cash. Dobu swoops in and takes the nine other real ones. Dobu meets with Arakawa to save the game before the second part of the mission. He ain't trying to go back to level one. And Arakawa tries to delete the save file by putting the tracking device in Dobu's van. Danraku mourns over the death of his daughter. The Homo sapiens performed on the M1 and is surprisingly good until things get real. Shibigaki realizes that though he wants to be a successful comedian, his life was the joke. Big Dama stops Yano and takes him in for transporting large quantities of fake cash. Yano gets so mad that he stops rapping, and Shikiguchi is visibly shook. Dobu makes off the last case of real cash. After he gloats, he suspects that Arakawa may betray him. Tanaka arrives at the scene ready to violate, auditioning for Thriller and shit. Dobu is confident that he will win this battle because my boy Tanaka is out of bullets. Tanaka realizing that he has truly hit rock bottom wants only an apology from Arakawa. Arakawa doesn't know what he's apologizing for, and the bug eyed bandit is furious. He apologizes anyway, and then things come full circle. The thing that turned Tanaka's life upside down falls right in front of him. Tanaka pieces it all together, and now wishes that his shot to wound was a shot to kill. Tanaka asks Dobu if Dish 11 rings a bell, and this is the point that I busted out laughing. Dobu was already such a bum, but to hold an auction and never pay out seems like something he would do in his youth, from childhood delinquency to adulthood felonies describes his straight-faced gorilla. He denies the accusations in the funniest way, cause we know his cap, but he sounds so convincing. Arakawa verifies that Dobu is indeed Ditch 11, based off of his Zudin profile pic. Tanaka gets the ultimate revenge. He attempts to take the life of the person who attempted to ruin his. Plus, he makes off with the infamous original Master Don Raku Eraser. Arakawa sees this as retribution, leaving Dobu to pay for his sins. And Mai is given what is rightfully his, and Yano and Shikiguchi refuse to take the L. Respectable. Little Damon finds his brother starfished and himself hurt and disappointed. The person he vowed to fight crime with. The person he respected. The person with the same unhealed scars and trauma. The person he counted on the most. Let him down. Then we learn Big Damon's motives. 
like Arakawa, who truly just wanted to thank the man who supported him through the most vulnerable time in his life. Both birds forced to leave the nest too early, orphaned by traffic accidents. It is the night of Christmas Day, and Arakawa is in a high-speed chase. He chased by bandits, and bandits chased by justice. Through Arakawa's childhood diary, Goriki sees the abysmally dark past of Arakawa. Goriki and Shirakawa rush to the scene. Shibagaki swallows his pride and pleads for Baba to be a straight man again. Nakato suffers from a guilty conscience. Ichimura's future of being rich is in jeopardy, and we can deduce that Watagaki's mother lives every day with regret of not attaining her dreams. This resentment within herself is a huge burden to her daughter, because now she has to live through her daughter. Success for Watagaki is also success for her mother, but failure is unacceptable. Kakihana reminisces on his free fall past rock bottom. Kabasawa resumes posting online, but from a place of humility. Dr. Goriki finds out that Arakawa has visual agnosia caused by executive dysfunction, where it lapses in cognitive function due to brain damage to store what his eyes perceive. Thus why he sees animals, why we see animals, and why the characters were so eerily human. The pursuit grows larger. Then it happens. The bird that was forced to leave the nest too early finally gets to fly. As Arakawa plummets, the characters within a web of mystery see the thread that ties them all together cut, all their vices and problems being consumed by the silent aggression of the ocean. Arakawa drowns accepting his fate, but remembers that he still needs to thank the Tapir that offered him solace in his most vulnerable state, the giver of toy birds. Even in the depths of the sea, his will to live burns brilliantly. Shirakawa yet again saves his life with makeshift corporea. Arakawa comes to, and we see the reality behind the figments of the once brought with his imagination. Arakawa looked at me rough some people since the age of 10. He said, he said, oh, you look like a gorilla, so you're a gorilla now. And your face is long as shit. You can be hoarse. How did Almost Drown Again fix the curious case of the animal seeing walrus? This is a medical mystery that is going to stun researchers for decades. Oh, he sees animals, sir. Drown him. Goriki and Shirakara look just as I would imagine. Arakawa is no longer anxious around humans, but just women though. We see how Dobu looks like and I understand why he turned towards a life of crime. He can turn a human to a cyclops. He looks like he chases squirrels and eats raccoons. Damon looks like a cornball, and we learn that he was the one who shot Dobu one of those times. Ru Nakata looks just like her anima version. Oh yeah, and she's arrested for the murder of Yuki. Yamamoto, Yano, and Shikiguchi are all arrested too. Yamamoto looks nothing like how I thought. I imagined a more chiseled jawline and shortcut hair. Yano and Shikiguchi were spot on though. Imai comes to see Arakawa, and this shit has to be some crazy fan flick that made it past the editors. Imai looks like what a Reddit fan would draw of his anima version. Imai gives Arakawa the money that fell into the sea, which I still doubt could fit into that small bag. And Arakawa remembers who he drove that fateful night two months ago. Takeo from the Yamabiko Lokia Milf. Arakawa meets with Kurita, the Tapir. Kurita acknowledges his failures as a man and a leader. With the death of his friend's daughter and the arrest of his subordinates, he decides to retire. From an altruistic view, he has done more good than bad. So Arakawa looks past his crimes, for yet to be a very special person to rule with an iron fist in the underworld without killing anyone. Arakawa thanks Kurita for his charity and repays him with 100 million yen. There was a real cat in Arakawa's home all along, and this is followed with a heartwarming scene of Arakawa ready to tackle life, free from the bonds of his childhood trauma. Then we get the absolutely unexpected, jaw-dropping news that Altax was really on the assimilator and Watagaki was only finishing the level. The unexpected twist that left me scratching my head, that Sakura Watagaki was the one who killed Yuki Matsuya. Also though implied, there is more, that her mother may be aware of Watagaki's behavior and probably encourages it. Finally, within the web of mystery, we are introduced to the spider. Shibagaki and Baba are still thugging it out. Tanaka finally puts his past behind him. Kabasawa is a man on a mission. Kakahana is taking it one day at a time. And Dobu pays for his sins. Dr. Goriki and Nurse Shirakawa get to practice again with the clinic being reopened. And as for life for Hiroshi Atakawa, it possibly ends here. Because if the opposition has time to smile, you have probably been beat. Arakawa is on borrowed time, and Sakura Watagaki is the lender. If you're still here, but you're a real ass nigga, let's keep it a bean. But there's a video coming soon, solely about the timeline of events directly pertaining to the murder of Yuki Mitsuya, because I truly didn't see this coming. But for real, stay tuned though, because there is a vid coming about how cold all taxi is, and I think you will enjoy it if you're still here. And Brelskis, make sure you subscribe so when I drop the next video about all taxi or any other code series, you will know. If you fuck with all taxi, I'm sure you will like erased. Go watch it.
I made a video about a race because it does something that this show also does very well, and every short series has to perfect, which is setting a mood or a vibe early. Beat the goofy out that like button, slap the shit out that subscribe button. But hey, I appreciate you niggas for watching. Kiss on the left cheek, slap on the right. I'll see y'all when I see y'all, man.